Welcome to Monday's Mad Dogs and Englishman here with Charlie Cook. This is Kevin Williamson. We're going to have a little disagreement today, uh, which started in the uh, National Review editorial meeting this morning. Uh, uh, well, it started was, a while back. Actually. Well, a while it back. Continued. Yeah. Well, actually, it started in about uh, 1548, I believe. <laughs> but um, but Jay and I are on different sides of this, and Charlie and I are on different sides of this. And uh, I think it, you know, it goes to uh, some fundamental things about our philosophy as conservatives. And this is the case of uh, Cliven Bundy, who is this angry, gun-toting uh, Nevada cattle rancher who had this standoff with the uh, BLM guys over his grazing allotment and a 20-year lawsuit related to all of this. And at the end of the day, which is a terrible cliche, and I wish I hadn't just said that, but in the, in the final analysis... Ultimately. Uh, ultimately. When all is said and done... <laughs> You know, I, I, as a conservative, I, I believe that we have sort of a basic responsibility to be reasonably obedient to civil authorities and to follow the legal process and all that. But I'm sympathetic to these sorts of movements, and I'm sympathetic to these sorts of reactions. And I think every now and then, tarring and feathering a few BLM agents and running them out of town on a rail would be an excellent thing. So while I don't want to make the uh, Nevada situation... Um, precedent and a template for uh, for national policy, at least at this point. I'm glad to see these things happen every now and then. I'm glad for American citizens to stand up and say, no, uh, we're not going to cooperate with you on this, even if you have a court ruling on your side, even if the regulations have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed, because this is wrong, because the federal government essentially acts as a monopoly landlord in the state of Nevada, owning 87 percent of the land or whatever because it's making decisions based on you know tortoise welfare and driving people out of business who have been cattle ranches there for a long time who have some you know hereditary uh, claim to using the public land as members of the public and that's something that bothers me about this too people say well you have to pay the government it's government land it's public land there's a difference you know there we don't want to treat everything as the property of the federal government so if we're saying this is a public holding then sometimes we let members of the public do that so Charlie thinks I am too sympathetic here. He thinks that uh, my occasionally expressed sympathies for John Brown are uh, are misguided. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to later have a debate about the uh, virtues of General Robert Ross, who uh, burned Washington. And I think I'm going to be on the pro-Ross side, and uh, Charlie's going to be against his fellow Englishman here. So Charles, why am I um, why am I wrong to gleefully rub my hands together and enjoy the spectacle of these armed citizens in Nevada turning back the man. Well, I don't think you're, you're wrong as a matter of absolute principle. Certainly the slavish, Hobbesian, Rousseauian view of the state as being inevitably, inherently the will of the people and therefore unable to violate people's rights. I'm slightly, perhaps, harsh critique there of Hobbes and Rousseau. But that, that idea, which really does have purchase on the left uh, is certainly not anything uh, that I respect. So, you know, this is a country that was founded, forged in revolution and in disobedience. Um, it has had a experience with secession. It has a state, Texas, that has a, an interesting relationship, shall we say, with the federal government and always had, having been its own republic. And Frankly, the notion. Funny, no one in California feels that way. California was a republic too. Though. Yeah, but I don't think it does. <laughs> yeah, but but it, you know, the, the New Hampshire Constitution, for example, the original, I think, seventeen eighty seven New Hampshire Constitution, uh, explicitly includes the right to revolution, and it mm. and it says outright that obedience to tyranny is slavish, and you know, in the modern parlance, stupid, yeah. and. So I am with you absolutely on the principle there is a point at which one needs to fight, there is a point at which one needs to resist, there is such thing as an unjust law. I, however, probably have a higher threshold than you, and when balancing rebellion with a respect for the rule of law, my calculation is different than I think yours would be. Now, you mentioned John Brown, and this is a, a question that gets people all riled up now, as it did back then. Slavery and civil rights, I think, obviously come up to the mark. But it is worth saying that 
the reason, of course, and I know you're not advocating an actual revolution, at least not yet, but the uh, reason that George Washington is seen as a hero and not a traitor is because he won. You know, and in the final analysis, to borrow your phrase from earlier, the my hackneyed, lamentable, cliched phrasing. Yes. Yeah, the the history decides which rebellions are acceptable and which are not by whether they were successful or not, by and large. Yeah. Now we we started this conversation when the Colorado sheriffs decided that they would effectively nullify federal. Uh, laws and that they would nullify Colorado laws as well that they deemed to be unconstitutional. Uh, 15 round magazine limits and private registration of firearms. There is a big difference between a sheriff saying that he will allocate resources in such a way as to make a new law at the bottom of his priority list and standing on a pedestal as happened in Colorado and saying I will not enforce this law that is effectively nullification Mm -hmm. and you and I disagreed over this because I said look there is in my mind no way that it is worth violating the principle of the rule of law over a brand new law that affects you know the size of magazines um, and that is still being challenged in court and you disagreed. So maybe maybe if we use that as well as an example of this disagreement, you could explain why you disagree with me that that instance is not worth it. Well, I maybe mean, something we agree on. So uh, during the government shutdown and they, you know, cordoned off all these public areas and the veterans groups and various others just ignored it and, you know, ran over the barricades and some of them very cleverly picked them up and went and stacked them up in front of the White House. Now, these are guys clearly violating the law. Uh, they're violating, you know, specific federal statutes. Bad or good or okay? You're all right with that, aren't you? Because because it made us all smile. Charlie is looking very pensive for those of you uh, who don't have access to our non-existent video feed. Well, yes, I suppose that did make me smile. Yeah. Yes. So I suppose the question is, what's the difference between that? Well, for a start, I think perhaps that's different than the case of the Colorado sheriffs because the actors in that case are citizens and not people who've sworn to uphold. So maybe maybe we should keep our conversation to the uh, Nevada ranchers yeah. because you can, for example, as a sheriff, if you believe the law to be unconstitutional and you cannot enforce it, you can resign from your position as sheriff. Yeah, yeah. But if you're a citizen and you're on the other end of it, so rather than rather than mixing up issues, maybe we should stick to the cattle ranchers and the, the veterans who entered the... Yeah. Let me uh, try a different uh, approach here, because um, something that, you know, I, I, I tried to start this conversation with Jay this morning, but uh, unfortunately I had other business to get on with. So we believe that citizens in a free republic such as ours have you know, a basic duty to obey the law. The state has a duty to obey the law as well, and it doesn't. Uh, We've written a dozen editorials at National Review about the uh, various lawlessness of the Obama administration. It's outright ignoring of uh, law in uh, any number of circumstances. The supplantation, uh, the supplanting of real legislative law by uh, what you like to call enabling acts, the, uh, you know, regulatory state. Um, You know, all this stuff, when you add it up, gets to the very uncomfortable and difficult question of legitimacy okay uh, in, in which cases are this is, is it appropriate to uh, to resist now here's what I would I, I would I like to have this discussion with you put it this way you know this this sort of final revolutionary question of is the state legitimate or not you know I, I don't think we're anywhere near being at the point of talking about but it certainly has overstepped its boundaries and done illegitimate things in lots of places now there's always the question of at what aggregate point does that turn into, you know, categorical illegitimacy? And again, I don't think we're there. So, but I think when there are instances, you know, on the one side, it's it's justifiable to have instances of resistance on the other side. Okay, but here is my problem with that line of argument. The reason that National Review uh, has run those editorials, the reason I have written pieces criticizing the Obama administration, and the reason that you have taken such exception to this, is that you don't think they should have done it. In other words, that you think that they were behaving immorally or illegally, which Mm. they were. Now, it seems odd to say, well, we have hit the president repeatedly for disobeying the law. 
so we will do it as well. I mean, if he's doing it in principle, and the reason at the root at the root of it, it you know, if, if we were to look behind the reason that there's a law, because simply saying, well, there's a law, I mean, it might be a reason to follow it, but it's certainly not a reason to say vote for it or uphold it or what you will. The reason that we have a system of the rule of law in the United States and indeed in much of the West uh, is that it serves to shortcut uh, short circuit, I should say, caprice. Mm. I mean, the, the, the heart of tyranny is caprice. It's the notion that the leaders can just decide what they're going to do. It's the reason we have the right to a trial. It's the reason we have due process and so on and so forth. Now, the president has shown a remarkable willingness, and Eric Holder indeed has almost codified this as a principle, yeah. to refuse to defend laws that he doesn't like, to pick and choose enforcement of law and by and large the left has cheered him on while he's done it mm. now we object to that because you can't run a society in which the leaders in the government decide which laws they will enforce and with what vigor and so on but you also can't run a society in which the people decide which ones they will obey and which ones they will not all over the place so sure I enjoyed watching the uh, military veterans go into the park that was closed. I think there's a question as to whether that closure was actually legal in the first place, but we'll leave that to one side and arguendo and presume that you're right. But I have some questions about we, whether these tortoise rules were legal too. Right, but but hang, well, absolutely, and 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 that's relevant. That is relevant to it, but that's not the case you're making. Mm. The case you're making is that it is good for society to have some pushback. Now, I. I I understand that and I appreciate that and I think that that's right. For example, I like that the citizens of Connecticut seem to have en masse refused to register their assault weapons. Yeah. But I can't defend it on principle and I can't really construct a good uh, principle case as to why that should be allowed because there is no logical system in place there to determine what is a good law to ignore and what is a bad law to ignore. You just have to win. It's basically victory by force and if so if Connecticut gets this law to go away it's, it's repealed because nobody is following it or the police decide they're not going to obey it then you say well that was great because they won but what if they don't win hmm. does that make it wrong how do you define the morality here so Bundy won right so does that mean he's right because the hmm. president has won on his refusing to uh, enforce Obamacare's provisions and they've won on refusing to defend say uh, gay marriage provisions across the country where states have just declined to defend the law even though they have to and California declined to defend Proposition 8 even though it was passed by law. How do you how do you determine this? Yeah, Is it I pure think, democracy? Because that's yeah, not a good... Well, no, it's not. I think, you know, there's a question here related to remedies and, uh, and the accessibility of remedies. So, for instance, you take the Obamacare stuff. Not only is it a, you know, federal law, which is a very difficult thing to uh, undo as opposed to something at the state or local level, but it's also a federal law that is one step removed from the political process because basically the, uh, the ACA just creates an administrative mm -hmm. apparatus to issue its own laws. So if you're looking for some redress against that, you know, as a practical matter, there's not really very much. So, you know, if you're unhappy with your local school board, you're unhappy with your state government, even in a big state like California or New York or Texas, you know, there are ways to do that. But if it's the Bureau of Land Management, which has some obscure interpretation of some ancient piece of legislation is being used in a way it was probably never intended to, but you're pretty sure you're never going to get satisfaction from the federal courts, which are very differential to the administrative state. You know, you start to look at these sorts of things and wondering what kind of real redress uh, you have. And now I think that ultimately we'll agree on this, that this is really more an argument for federalism, localism, and limited government than it is for, you know, a uh, 1776 style uh, right in quotation marks or inverted commas, as you would call them. Uh, to revolution. But, um, you know, again, I think that when you're looking at these kinds of situations where people, rightly or wrongly, and I think in this case rightly, don't feel like they have any real, <clears throat> excuse me, legitimate, reliable, honest, and transparent path of redress, that every now and then it's good for people just to put their feet down and okay. say no. So distinguish that for me from the routine left-wing claim 
that the president has had to exercise and push the bounds of his executive authority because Congress is uniquely recalcitrant and he has no way of making the government work and the governments have to govern. Yeah, well, I think the way to distinguish that is that, you know, in one case the argument is true, in the other case the argument is false. Um, the argument that this Congress and this House, which is controlled by Republicans, has been sort of uniquely recalcitrant, uh, simply doesn't account for the legislative record. You know, if you look at what's gone through the House, they've passed a lot of stuff. It's stuff that goes to the Senate to die. So I just don't think that argument bears... But suppose you know, it were true. I mean, suppose... Because I take the view that if a, the House elected to come into session mm -hmm. and just literally say no to any piece of legislation, which is its prerogative, yeah. it, it has the power to do it, that that would in no way justify executive overreach. Well, no, of course, because the whole argument for executive overreach assumes some unique and predominant presidential role in governance, which is not the case. We have three equal branches, and the legislative branch can you know, do as it, as it sees fit. So now I think there's you know a, a case for using things like public pressure and that kind of thing to try to make uh, branches and organizations government do their job when they're not doing it, but no, I don't think those are really very comparable arguments at all. But but, but hang on, but the argument you're making is that the rule of law doesn't apply in some situations because there's no way that those who would violate it can seek redress. Well, I. I We'll go one step beyond that, and as you know, I think the rule of law is kind of a convenient myth. Um, I don't think we really live under anything like the rule of law. I think we live under a system of basically arbitrary political power uh, that works within a certain you know, historical and traditional context that's somewhat rooted in our Constitution, but not really, and that's fairly dispersed where you've got lots of federal courts and branches of the federal government that don't always agree with each other, so you don't get this you know, uh, centralized dictatorial response. But if you, you know, you look at the, hand me the last 50 or 60 Supreme Court rulings and, uh, and try to make for me the case that it's really based in the letter of the law. Um, if it were based on something other than politics, I think there'd be a lot less, a lot fewer 5-4 decisions. Uh, you know, we've got this great panel, allegedly, of legal scholars who can't seem to agree on what the law means, but they always seem to line up according to their uh, partisan uh, affiliations. I mean, this isn't 100% the case, but it's pretty pretty well the case. I think if you look uh, similarly at the federal court system, if you look at, my God, the behavior of the IRS and other unaccountable branches of the administrative state, I think it's difficult to make the case that the rule of law, at least in some you know, very strong version of that idea is actually what governs this country. I think this government country is governed by power, like but any so other what, country. But so what? So when it boils down to it, your argument is, well, they're doing it, so we should. And would it? Here's a question for yeah, you. I, I'll, I'll confess there is an element of that to it. Yeah. And would your view change if the government were a paragon of virtue? Yes, it would. I think if we had a federal government, particularly particularly the federal government, I mean the states are, are a different situation, that was very circumspect about the use of its power, that was um, very scrupulous about trying to keep to its constitutional role to defer to the states where it's supposed to, to mine the Bill of Rights and things like that, then I would be less uh, confrontational, I think. I would be less inclined to have these sorts of civil actions. It's sort of like, you know, we, we've talked about this before with the income tax. I'm not sure the income tax is a good idea at all, and I'm not 100% sure that the way it was adopted was totally legal or any of that sort of stuff. But if it was 3%, we wouldn't fight about it. You know, if we're going to have a uh, federal government that's spending, whatever it's spending right now, 30-odd percent of income, then we're going to fight, you know, over that tax system. We're going to fight over appropriations. We're going to fight over that kind of stuff. At some level, if you reduce the federal footprint down to, you know, a boy can dream and say 4 or 5% of GNP, something like that, then I'm not going to do politics anymore. You know, if the federal government has shrunk down by that much, I'm going back to writing poetry or uh, writing novels or whatever, because 4% of GDP is not really that much worth fighting over if it's, if it's the aggregate thing. But we have such a large and intrusive and inescapable state uh, that 
is telling you down to where you can put a cow in relation to a turtle or tortoise rather and not just a category of tortoises but a particular geographic population of tortoises that has to be treated in a certain sort of way in regard to your cattle you know when you've got a government that it's that intrusive and that omnipresent I'm not sure that you know just entirely being scrupulous about reliance on redress through lawsuits and elections and things like that is really going to be where we need to be, especially when the government itself doesn't respect those bounds. So can tomorrow the hordes of progressives who listen to this podcast decide that they're going to start rebelling as well, mm. and that's all right? Well, you know, I think, um, I think ultimately it matters whether you're in the right or not. So the left, whether they're using elections or whether they're using lawsuits or whether they're using anything else, are still wrong. Uh, what they want is still wrong. What they want is still the opposite of what a good and just and virtuous and free society needs. So will they be especially wrong? Let me, well, let me put it this way, um, and I think maybe we'll agree on this. If a couple of ranchers and their neighbors out in Nevada should happen to tar and feather a BLM agent, and run him out of town on a rail, I'm going to smile. And if they get prosecuted for it for assault afterward, I think that's okay too. You know, if you're going to do civil disobedience, you have to be willing to pay the price for it. Oh, right, but that's not a rule of law violation because that is the law. Yeah. I mean, you can do that. You can always take what you want and pay for it. Yeah. What we're discussing here is people doing what they want but then being uh, rewarded for it in some way. Yeah, I think so. Well, again, I think you hit it on the hit it on the head. It matters whether you win or lose, and it looks like for now the people in Nevada are winning. Although I'd be surprised if that lasts very long. Um, this always makes me sound like a more of a kook than I am. And uh, and by the way, just for the record, the, the, the guy in Nevada is a kook. I mean, he's got all sorts of crazy theories about you know the federal government and all that. You know, this is not someone I want to be my my standard bearer. At the same time, you know, I wouldn't want the kooks uh, who were locked up in their compound in Waco, Texas, to be uh, my standard bearer because these people were nuts. But you know, I was there uh, for that siege. I watched how the government handled that, and uh, it did not give me faith no, no. in the uh, rule of law or the uh, prudence or uh, scrupulousness of the federal authorities. So. You know, I, I have uh, a disinclination to take them at their word and to assume that they are acting in anything like, uh, you know, a, a sense of adherence to uh, the spirit or the letter or the law or the Constitution. I suppose in some regards this whole conversation rests heavily and thankfully on the premise of, of natural rights or at least some form of consistent philosophical argument that supposes natural rights or a creator, mm. in that if you remove, as the early 20th century progressives not only did, but sought to do forever, the concept of natural rights, whatever that means to you uh, from the equation, then there is actually nothing that government can't do uh, to you yeah. that you can't um, uh, uh, that that you can oppose. I mean, you know, the, the only way that you can oppose the gov government action is to say that it doesn't work, or to plead your case, right? Rather than to appeal to ideals that sit above it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I said at the beginning, you and I agree, I think, on the natural rights question, right? No, <laughs> I have I, my, I have some skepticism about the whole idea of natural rights, honestly, because you know it's a, it's a metaphysical proposition, right? So you know you're a non-believer, and I'm a I'm a believer. I don't think it's necessarily a metaphysical proposition. Well, let me finish up the point here. So you're a non-believer, and I'm a believer. So you know the the founders, at least you know some of them, believe that our rights came to us from God. There are a lot of people who come from the Enlightenment tradition. Uh, who believe in essentially the same rights, but they are, you know, small in natural things that are discoverable through reason, which is also the Catholic position on this stuff, that all the stuff that's, you know, divinable through revelation is also divinable through reason. And I think that's a fine philosophical tradition, but, you know, when I go out and I walk around in the woods, I never tripped over a pile of rights. 
Um, so, I mean, you can make arguments that you know, these are inherent to our nature as human beings, or that this is God's will, or whatever, but those are by definition unwinnable arguments because they all, you know, essentially rest on unprovable and undemonstrable uh, premises. Now, they may be good arguments, and the idea of natural rights may produce good results, and so that I'm glad there are a lot of, you know, feeble-minded, susceptible people out there who believe in these things. But uh, People such as myself. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just like I'm glad there are people who believe in the rule of law, even though I kind of don't, you know, I think it's a, it's a useful, um, it's a useful bit of mythology. And maybe it's, you know, more than that, it's something worth trying to live up to. You know, it's, a, it's an ideal. And ideals are, are excellent things, if they're good ideals. And it gives us a target to shoot at. But, um, so to speak, I don't, don't want to maybe take that metaphor too far. But, um, you know, in the end, I have a very cynical uh, view of what government is. I think it's, you know, it's it's contest of power. But but what it is... I hate to be all Foucaultian here no, for but a what, but, but just to push back, because what it is and how it behaves is separate from the question of how it should behave and whether a natural rights exist or the rule of law is a real thing worth fighting for and worth observing. And once again, I'd say it's entirely possible to criticize the government for not living up to its responsibilities. It's entirely possible to criticize the government for not adhering or respecting the natural rights that predated it, at least in the minds of those who wrote its charter, whether we believe they exist or not. It's entirely possible to criticize the government for not hewing to the rule of law, but also to say I will and that society should and that I will not behave as they do. That's why I asked you is the argument essentially well they're doing it so we should because for me the best way of countering the president's lawlessness or the lawlessness of those who would opt out of um, society is not to do it myself. Now again there is obviously a threshold and this, this is not an absolute principle. Right. There is obviously a threshold. You, you do not herd people into camps and say, well, this is the law. You expect them to fight. You would not accept uh, the invasion of um, a foreign power if the United States Congress had invited it in. Right. You would not uh, submit to fully unconstitutional behavior for too long from the United States government. You would not submit to the reintroduction of slavery and so on and so forth. But again, doesn't that threshold have to be quite high you know, it's what this reminds me of is, um, I may have mentioned this before, but uh, I was watching an episode of the television show Sleepy Hollow a few months ago, and it's the most conservative thing I've ever seen on television. So the story here is that Ichabod Crane, who has come back from the dead in the 21st century, turns out to have been essentially an intelligence operator for, uh, for General Washington. So he was you know, one of Washington's spies. So he's this, you know... 18th century character who is stuck in the 21st century and they have breakfast one day I think it's either from McDonald's or Dunkin Donuts and he says my god this breakfast costs three dollars and fifty cents that's absurd and then he says and an eight percent levy on baked goods you do realize the revolution was fought for less than this right <laughs> so you know there is a matter of perspective there um, well the actually, actually the, just to, just to yeah. buttress your point there the stuff we put up with now is in some regards far, far worse oh, yeah. than King, what was King predict. George never thought of doing anything half of what the modern federal government does. No, and you does. look at the European Union, for example. The European Union is a far greater tyranny than the British were in the colon colonial America. Sure. For Britain, that is. But, Carol. Yeah. So, again, you know, I think it's a matter of scale. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm not really a biblical literalist type, but I do note you know, from the... Uh, from the scriptures that God only asked for 10% and uh, the federal government asked for rather more than that. So, you know, again, I think that um, we'll probably never come to a real uh, solution on this and when it's appropriate to push back and when it's not. And um, again, I think I would, I would concede that you don't want to make Nevada and things like that a general guiding principle for how we behave because we still have basically a, a decent and responsive government in many ways. And it's still better to try to reform it through, you know, traditional sorts of means. But every now and then a little sedition is an excellent thing, and I'm glad to see it. And just makes me, uh, it makes me have a little more hope for my country than I normally do. So, final thoughts, Charlie? We've run a little long here. Well, I suppose my, my final thoughts are as 
confused, as they often are on these topics, in that, you know, I like to joke that I'm an atheist who believes in original sin. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a sort of rule of law junkie who agrees with what you just said. <laughs> so <laughs> it is a difficult one. And, and there is obviously judgment in these situations. There is a necessary judgment. For example, jury nullification. That is putting these questions in the hands of people so that they can look at a situation and say, no, we believe in this case the law shouldn't effectively have applied or it's a bad law or this is an outlier. So there is a judgment there. But I find establishing a general principle from these cases not only difficult but dangerous. Yeah. Well, I guess I was going to let you have the last word, but I just made me want to think of something. So I think there is one general principle that should be kept in mind here always, which is that <coughs> that Charlie's allergic <laughs> yeah. to my offensive views. Uh, I'm, just, which, I'm allergic to anyone getting the last word. I'm not used to it. All right, yeah. <laughs> we'll also have a jar of mustard here that might be bothering you. But um, Which is this, that the federal government exists at the sufferance of the people and not the other way around. True. And I think that's the thing that always should be kept in mind, that sovereignty really inheres in the people and not in Washington. And I suppose we could do another half hour, an hour on this, but um, we really have done a great deal of violence to our political order by allowing the states to be subsumed to the extent that they have by the federal government. Yes. You know, the states are supposed to be states in the modern sense of that word, not merely subdivisions of the monster based in D.C. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that, because over the weekend, uh, Kate and I watched Bonnie and Clyde, the recent A&E drama and Bonnie and Clyde skip around the various Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas area and drove and committed their crimes along the state lines. And the reason that they did this was because in the late 1920s and early 1930s police officers in say Texas had to stop at the border. They were not allowed to go over. I had a debate about this recently with Dan Foster this is pre-FBI, of course, and he suggested that that was a ridiculous arrangement. Now, I understand that it must have been extremely frustrating, and I'm not suggesting that Bonnie and Clyde were in any way admirable and that their deaths were not a good thing. I, you flinched when I said that, so maybe we'll do this tomorrow. But no, I'm firmly anti-bank robber. Okay, good. <laughs> Me too. Except but, that song by The Clash, which is a really good song. Sure. But there is something beautiful about the idea of the states being that discreet and having that much power. And it always has to be remembered that whatever political system you set up, you're going to have upsides and downsides. Yeah. And I'm not so sure that having police officers unable to cross the line of a state in pursuit of a Bonnie and Clyde and their gang is, is uh, so bad if you consider the virtuous yeah. results of the states having that much authority and the local nature of politics and the responsiveness of states to their people that that engendered. So it just got me thinking yesterday um, along along those lines too. You'd think better radios and some uh, you know mutual extradition packs would solve that problem pretty quickly, but they just maybe came along too early in time for well, that. Well, yes, but again, I mean, the, uh, allowing the states, or I say allowing, that's probably the wrong word, because they we're were created... We're going to drop for another hour now. <laughs> they were created before the federal government, but allowing uh, the states that much leeway, or the situation being such that it allows the states that much leeway, is going to cause some states, for example, to make decisions that I wouldn't like or that wouldn't work very well. And one of those could be to have no extradition treaty. Right. And yeah. this is, of course, always my argument when it comes to, say, the shutdown or people who I touched on this earlier say, but the president had to behave like this because Congress chose not to do what I want. Well, yes, Congress is allowed to do that. Congress is allowed to make really bad decisions sure. and so on and so forth. So. You know, I've never found persuasive the argument that, well, because this leads to bad outcomes, it should therefore be ignored. And I suppose this brings us full circle with our rule of law conversation. It does indeed. All right, folks, we'll talk to you tomorrow. In the Bonnie and Clyde special. Yes.